Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue with verses 262 and 263, which read as follows. Navakaranamatena Vana Pokaratayava Sadhu rupo narohoti isuki machari sartho yasachetang samuchinang mula ghachang samuhatang sa vanta doso medhavi sadhu rupo tivuchati which means Not from giving speeches or from beauty of appearance is a person called respectable or of good form, of good form. If they are uh, jealous, miserly and deceitful, For whom these things are uh, fully cut off, samuchinang, fully cut off, cut off at the root, destroyed. Such a person who has anger removed or has has anger removed and is wise such a wise one with anger removed that person is called sadhu rupa uh, of good form so this verse was taught uh, to, to a group of monks who were living in the Buddha's monastery or came to the Buddha's monastery and saw all these young novices, novice monks who had ordained and taken the, eight, the ten precepts. So they were like monks in training. And they saw them learning the Dhamma from other monks, learning how to chant and recite the Dhamma. It's the first step is memorize it. So they probably did just a lot of memorization. The great thing about memorizing is it, it's like taking the books with you. And then you can always refer back to them. It's not, of course, uh, a replacement for actual practice. But if you are keen on practice, memorization is quite valuable for your practice to be able to remember exactly what the Buddha said on this topic or that topic. But what they really noticed and were really interested in was the fact that after these novices learned the Dhamma from uh, the various mo monastic teachers, they then uh, waited on them did uh, m many services for them. Like they would sweep out their kutis and bring them uh, tooth pa toothbrushes and uh, clean up after them, clean up and, and bring them food and uh, you know, many different things. And also just overly, overall just respected the monks and paid reverence to them. And this group of monks thought to themselves, Oh, well, we know the Dhamma as well. Here's what we should do. We'll go to the Buddha and we'll say, Venerable Sir, we are well versed in the Dhamma. Don't tell these, these novices they shouldn't uh, memorize, the, recite the teachings without having learned it from us. Tell them to come and learn from us. If we if we say that to the Buddha, then th this is <laughs> their words. Of, then we will get, we will we will have much gain come to us. This is what they were thinking. It's maybe a bit of a simplistic 
telling of the story, but uh, it is it should be fairly familiar. The idea of people seeking out gain. So they went to the Buddha and they told them the Buddha this, and the Buddha thought to himself, "It's true. This what they say is actually proper. I mean, it's proper that students wait on their teachers, but these guys are just doing it for gain. Their their only desire is for gain. So I better teach them something." And he taught them this verse. And the relation for the verse is that the word sadhu rupa means something like respectable. So it relates to how they wanted to be respected. They considered this a great gain for them to be well respected, to have people uh, honor them and revere them and so on. So they thought of themselves as, they didn't even actually consider whether they were worthy of it. They just wanted it and they saw how to get it. So a simple story. The lessons from this, especially relating to meditation practice, the first is really the, the lesson of the story regarding things like gain. The Buddha taught the four worldly dhammas, gain, praise, fame, and, ha and pleasure. And it may may seem like kind of a worldly teaching, not a, a simple, basic teaching, much more suitable for people who aren't dedicated to meditation practice. It doesn't relate to how to do walking, how to do sitting. But when you think about it, it has very much to do with the reasons why we practice. We practice in order to see through the addictions and attachments that we have. We ultimately come to practice to be free from suffering. And the secret to suffering, the secret to the cause of suffering is that it relates to our desire for things that can't satisfy us. The essence of the practice is about seeing, as you know, the three characteristics. And what these relate to is all of these worldly things. Why can't we find happiness? Why can't we find satisfaction in the world? Even though we're always seeking out gain, we're always seeking out praise, we're always seeking out uh, fame or, or a good name, st uh, no, social status, right? We want to be the people that everyone looks up to and honors and reveres and so on. And, and pleasure, I mean, ultimately, all we're looking for is pleasure. It's the, the most deep-seated of all desires. Even with all of that, why is it that we don't find satisfaction? Why aren't we happy? And so you can see it takes a bit of a... Um, uh, a maturity in order to be able to see through that. And so that's the first thing we are reminded of with this story, is how easily human beings or beings in the world are led astray, seeking out things that are not worth seeking out. The Buddha called them the anarya paryesana, seeking out these things. It can often be a challenge for meditators to wonder why they are uh, taking all this time when to, to torture themselves, to do something that's so unpleasant and hard when they could easily, just as easily go back and enjoy all the pleasures that they think exists in life. And so it takes a, a real maturity to see through that, to be able to commit yourself to withdrawing to trying to see beyond or find happiness that lies beyond these very enticing, um, very familiar sources of what we think are happiness. And so the practice of mindfulness is what allows us to see, is allows us to gain this maturity and to see through it. Because we learn that 
and we learn not through intellect, intellectual learning, but we learn through our practice, that gain is coupled with loss. Praise is coupled with blame. High society is coupled by loss of society. Happy pleasure is coupled with pain. Impermanent. While pain doesn't last forever, neither does pleasure. Gain is only possible because of loss. You can only gain if you've lost. And this is how we go through samsara, gaining and losing when we die. Losing throughout our lives, but ultimately losing everything when we die. And then we have to gain again. And we're stuck in this cycle that's not nearly as satisfying as we believe it to be. So the other part of this lesson, the other thing we can learn from the story is how not only do you become blind to the fact that uh, these things can't satisfy us, it's actually even worse than that. What we learn, what we're reminded of should be fairly familiar to us, but what this story reminds us of is a good example of is how it also corrupts our mind. Not only does it blind us, or are we blind to the impermanence, we're also led astray to the extent of harming others, manipulating others. When you look at this story, it's, it's a case of people doing something quite terrible. It doesn't seem so bad, but it's manipulation, using the Buddha's teaching for their own personal gain. And, and manipulating people in order to do it, saying that Let's make let's make sure all these students come to us, uh, and then w and why not because we think we can teach better, but because then it will be to our benefit. It will it will allow us to satiate our, our greed. And so it's a simple, it's a silly perhaps uh, example, but it, uh, it does exemplify this problem that not only do sensual pleasures and worldly gains of all kinds fail to satisfy us they also lead us to to great potential for evil to harm others we, it leads what leads people to kill it's what leads people to steal it's what leads people to be jealous the buddha brings it up he really drives it home for these monks reminding them that they're jealous they are uh, they are deceitful. Sarto, he, he includes that. So the, in some ways the verse seems tailored for the audience. But it's a reminder of the sorts of things that come from this incessant uh, search for worldly pleasure. Because the problem is that when you're engaged in seeking out pleasure, there's no room for clarity. There's no room for seeing the actual experiences. Our mind, our seeing of things is so very weak. The objects that we see is so f fleeting. And immediately our, the habit uh, asserts itself. And we're off in judgment, in reaction, in clinging and craving. We lose sight of the experience. There's a really uh, important framework to understand how th how how this this whole process works. That mindfulness is really just all about that. It's about having the strength of mind to really experience something, to have the clarity of mind to really see what's there. And it's not actually complicated. It's not like it's something that you don't already know intellectually. It's just that your mind perceives things with such an, uh, a proclivity to react. We can't see without reacting. We can't hear without reacting. We can't feel without reacting. We can't think without reacting. We have a bad attitude, bad habits of interaction. And mindfulness is really just all about changing that. Letting you see that seeing is just seeing. It seems trivial. Why should, of course, I know seeing is already seeing. Ah, but that's not how you 
That's not how you approach these things. Seeing for you is so much more. Seeing is all. Oh, feeling is so much. Thinking. What do our thoughts give us? They make us lost in so much greed, so much anger, so much delusion. Conceit and you know all kinds of things. And so it's quite a simple thing and yet it's uh, it's it's completely uh, the opposite of our ordinary way of approaching things that leads us to seek and to chase and leads us to to blindness. We don't see how we're not being satisfied because we're just not with our experiences. We're not watching. We're not watching what is. We're looking for what we what isn't yet. We're looking for what we don't yet have. Or how to get rid of what we have. Constantly put the push and pull of seeking out good things, running away from bad things. We're never actually aware. We don't ever have that clarity. And so it leads us to not see that they're satisfying, but also leads us to not see how harmful to ourselves and others this becomes. How we not only harm ourselves, but we harm others as well. And it can lead people on, on terrible paths. Drug addicts are perhaps the best example, the clearest example. But they're the natural uh, conclusion, the natural result of extreme blindness due to desire. You can be so addicted to drugs that you will steal or kill or you know, lie and cheat and all kinds of things just to get what you want. So that's, I think, the the thing that this story reminds us of, is why we're here. The, the, we're really, there really is something good and worth encouraging in, in the practice of meditation, because you can't find happiness elsewhere. There's no thing in the world that can make you happy. All the things... All these thoughts about this will make me happy or that will make me happy, they are wrong. You can be reassured that leaving here and going and seeking out those pleasures won't lead to happiness. It's not capable of it. The other lesson relates to the verse and and sort of the, the thrust of the verse. And it really deals with the difference between the appearance of good and actual goodness. And so it's useful for us to understand that the type of goodness that we're seeking out is actually its actually on a, a deeper level even than the actual meditation. But our ordinary idea of goodness might be something like knowing what's right and wrong. Maybe even believing what's right and wrong. We would say, well, I've studied all the Buddha's teachings and I know what's right and wrong. And and I really believe in it as well. And that's that's good and useful. Um, it it can help you to make the right decisions in this life. But it's also something you can forget. It's something you can uh, fail in, because you might know something and in the spur of the moment forget it. Uh, the way you see Buddhists sometimes slap at a mosquito. Because it was, they were just too, too, it was just too quick. You know, I keep the precepts. I've, I've promised to keep them, but, uh, but it's better. It's better that you know, of course. If you know what's good and what's bad, it leads people to do good things and not do bad things. But the Buddha teaches here. He he drives home the point that these monks, and by extension, we can think of of all of us and people who are practicing. Well, these monks were in the category of those who uh, hadn't cut off anything yet. They knew all these things, but they had no right to assume that they were worthy of any respect because they hadn't actually cut anything off. They hadn't actually become anything special. And that really is a, an important distinction in Buddhism. And so what's useful for us is to understand that the goal is not just to come here and learn some intellectual things or, or get some good 
useful practices in our life. It's to actually free ourselves. So actually, actually come to the point where we cut off these uh, bad habits, where we actually have no potential to crave or to hate or to uh, be, be be confused or be mi or misunderstand reality. So the three things we have cut we can cut off greed, we cut off anger, we cut off delusion, and this only comes by seeing what we call the Four Noble Truths. So it only comes when your meditation gets to the point where you not only appreciate, say, the three characteristics, but you truly see them. You come to the point where your mind says, all phenomena, all, all arisen phenomena are impermanent. Not in, you know, it's, not a, it's not a voice line in your head, but there's a realization, like you just get it. And all it takes is that moment where the mind gets it for there to be this experience of letting go. And it's that experience, that realization and that letting go that is called samuchinang, uh, samucheda. It's true death in Buddhism. Death in Buddhism is not the death of a human being because human beings, are when they die, they're born again, of course. It's just conceptual. The reality is... Well, they keep living, they keep experiencing. The, the body just changes. But samucheda is where there's real, the real death. And it's not the death of a person or an individual. It's the death of, of evil. The only thing that can truly die is our defilements, our, our bad habits, our misunderstandings, our seeking out of things that can't satisfy us. And it dies because we've found something that actually truly can satisfy, that is true peace, true happiness. You feel that peace. When the mind lets go, there can be no uh, den no doubt after that about the true uh, peace, where true peace lies. And so it's considered the true cutting off. This is a person who is called sadhu rupa. And you're not sadhu rupa. Rupa is form, right? So it can refer to your physical form if you have beauty and, and physical appearance, the Buddha said, no, that's not true sadhu rupa. Nor is it because you give fancy, spe fancy speeches that make people impressed or you're able to recite all of the Buddha's teachings or something like that. He said, when you cut off all of these bad habits of seeking out things that can't satisfy you or worse, manipulating others to get what you want, and when you have no more wanta dosa, when you have no more anger, because you see that there's there's nothing there's nothing worth getting upset about. The experiences don't have that quality of them. An experience doesn't have the quality of being uh, desirable or unpleasant. Experiences are either seeing or hearing or smelling or tasting or feeling or thinking, and that's all they are. And you start to see that. You start to see that if you pay attention. And so that's what mindfulness is for. It gives you the tools to allow you to pay close attention and have clear attention and to see things as they are. And the Buddha said, that sort of person is wise. That is what true wisdom is, medhavi. A wise person, a medawi, is someone not who knows many things or can recite many things like these monks could, but one who knows for themselves and sees for themselves. Just very simple things. Someone whose perspective is clear. Seeing is just seeing. And they have no dependency on seeing certain things. Hearing, feeling, they are what they are. And they live independent. That's where true peace, true happiness, and true greatness, true respectability. You want to be worthy of respect? That's what makes you worthy of respect. And you want to respect someone, respect those people. So that's the teaching of the Dhammapada verse for this week. Thank you all for listening.